Welcome to week 12, e-marketing in review. It's the last week of semester, and we're going to have a look back over what happened and what took place. So, in our run schedule, we have just wrapping up the class participation and finalizing that portfolio. So let's look back. There are a few things we didn't cover in this course, and we're going to explain why. Now, one of the things that was left out is the concept of search engine optimization, because frankly, it's pretty much one of those areas where anybody who successfully manipulates a Google algorithm and openly states, hi, I've cheated the system, will then sell their book for $14.95 or $7.99 or their special super secret source seminar series for $349.99, if they have successfully routed past Google's operations, Google's just going to buy the book and pay for the course and change what happens next. What we did instead is we looked at authenticity. Now, one of the driving forces behind search engine optimization is the idea that the algorithm looks to replicate human behavior. So the more authentic the content is, the more your content is fit to audience and the type of words that your audience would use or the language they use to search or just the way that they would exist on the internet, the more likely it is your, so your content will do better. So search engine optimization is one of those dark arts that's also best considered one of those daft arts. It's, even if it was successful, it would be countered very easily because to make a widespread search engine optimization policy work, you'd have to let people know about it and Google would be able to counter it because they just simply look themselves up and find out. The second thing that we left out is we skipped over the funnels and any Facebook advert for Facebook marketing and online marketing you'll see will have somebody talking about funnels somebody else talking about lists. And when it comes down to it, a funnel is the IATA model. It's moving someone from awareness, interest. Uh, look at that, awareness. That's your top end view model. That's your IATA. Your consideration is interest. Your conversion is desire. Your loyalty and your advocacy is action. Also, this whole idea of lists and buying lists and creating... <sighs> If you're buying a list, you're doing it wrong. Functionally, if you are not in the position to acquire customers organically through a use of social media, a presence somewhere, or having keyword searchability of solving a problem someone else has, or even just existing on a forum previously before you start going out and selling things, you're not gonna generate the sort of traffic and people and customers that you want. So funnels and lists are one of these big areas where people are selling you snake oil and they're selling it by the gallon. And what we did instead is asked you to think about fundamentals of marketing, strategy, segmentation, targeting. A funnel functionally is targeting in application. It's segmentation in application. And we also got you to really consider your marketing mix alignment and how things work together. Dealing with the future. I am, by trade, a professional fortune teller, although I think the university prefers me to call it marketing strategist on my business card. The thing about the future, to start with, it's predictable to an extent. There are cycles, there are patterns, there are things you'll recognize. But also, it's the Hawthorne effect writ large. As soon as you successfully predict the future, you start engaging with the present, and you start making changes to that present, which either helps reinforce and solidify your future, or the result of you taking a series of actions means that your market and your, the counteractions by your competitors means that future that you had in mind no longer exists. But functionally, the future is really interesting. Uh, there are a few ways to do this. Back in the old school, uh, I used to use the Douglas Rushkoff uh, Cyber Tower. 
Now, Rushkoff is actually a futurist as well as a person who created a CD-based cyber tarot modernized <coughs> modernized for the 1990s with very 1990s aesthetics. Uh, ran up, I used to run it on my old Mac back in my uh, previous life at a university somewhere else. But functionally, the purpose of something like a futurist is futurists look for trends and patterns. They look to be able to make a call as what they think is a likely outcome from current events and extrapolate it down the pathway. Now the key thing about futurists, uh, love the work, want to get into it myself, think it's a brilliant area that you should definitely get involved in. My favourite futurist, Faith Popcorn, uh, and my second favourite futurist, Douglas Rushkoff, don't have a hugely successful strike rate in terms of predictions and predictability. But what you're looking for, uh, there's Mark Pesquet, who's also um, out there as a futurist. But what you're looking to do as a futurist is you want to present workable scenarios. You want to give people a view of if this, then what, rather than if this, then that. Now, the third area of old school fortune telling that I have plied my trade with is the modified GE matrix. Uh, I particularly like the GE matrix, as you might have gathered from making several appearances across the semester and showing up in assessment tasks now and then. But the idea of the matrixy and the, the fortune telling here is that you are predicting the opportunity and you are taking action based on your capacity. So you are looking at what a possible future could be and deciding how best to chase it, embrace it, or walk away from it. The fourth place of uh, fortune telling and futurisms to be aware of, uh, Terry Pratchett is, has got one of the best takes on fortune telling. Uh, look, a lot of Terry Pratchett's work is heavily influential in this course and the way I approach the world. But one of the things about fortune telling is that if you are going to practice it as a craft, there are two ways. And one of the ways, the con artist way, is the cold read, where you lay down a set of cards, and that could be anything, they could be Tim Tams, they could be empty packets of crisps, they could be whatever you want it to be. Because once they're on the table, they're immaterial to the reading. The reading is done as a cold reading by using psychology, using prompts and cues and cueing techniques and very open-ended questions like, oh, I, I see that there are some challenges ahead in your and troubling times. Has there been anything on your mind lately? And you draw in, ah, oh, yes, well, the cards, the cards are uh, clouded here and they're unsure as to your e-portfolio, could you tell me more? They, they mentioned this uh, challenge on the horizon. Is there something due shortly? And I basically try and get you to talk about your e-portfolio and then you, and then I hook from that and work onwards. I'm trained in cold reading, so it's one of those things that's in the portfolio of tricks that I have as a marketer. Uh, what we use cold reading for is we call it a focus group and we call it guided interviews and we use the same techniques of getting people to share their ideas and share their stories the elucidation of content we use that as an interview technique in qualitative research now way back in the pre-semester uh, and you'll see that there is now a PDF file on now, in week 12, a PDF file will appear inside the Wattle, and it will be the Celtic, the Celtic Cross Tarot spread that is here. And you can see by the metadata, by the upload date, and by the creation date, that it was run pre-semester. And what I'm interested here is just your take on how well did the cards, if you've got the PowerPoint uh, and you mouse over the particular 
images, you'll be able to see the pop-up explanations of them. But how well did this describe the semester? How well did this describe the experience for the subject? So a couple of things uh, in terms of predictions. By the way, the other thing you want to do is if you ever are doing fortune telling, or as we like to call it in the trade, marketing strategy, the key is to say confidently things that have a reasonably good chance of coming true, and if they don't, are relatively forgettable. Now, I'm going to throw down a couple of my predictions for where the future goes and what the future looks like. And the couple, my top call is that we are going to see the rise of home-based augmented reality as a way to create demarcation lines within the world of your home. Lockdowns, even with a wide with a widespread distribution of vaccines, there are still going to be lockdown moments. And augmented reality as a filter to be able to mark up your home environment, I think is going to see a step forward because a home environment is also capable of being a fixed point with a relative 3D space that you could make a much more powerful augmented reality set as a consumer, uh, as a consumer tool. So you could be quite easily putting, like the way you put 7.1 surround sound speakers around a living room, putting in the requisite VR cameras and tracker points will just be something that you stick up on the wall and that's there to help in the augmentation. Same way office-based augmented reality will be useful for being able to la layer in another level of data so that you've got capacity. So perhaps you're doing an assignment, your primary vision through your AR goggle of your keyboard, you've got your virtual monitor through the AR goggle, or you've got your actual monitors through uh, the AR, but you've got your PDF files, you've got your notes, you've got your other aspects overlaid around you, like my little overlay filter here, but dynamic and interactive. Being able to reach for a PDF file, drag it in to open it. Those sorts of things, those are a future user interface, I think, is going to be driven by extended lockdowns and lock-ins. Because I'm also going to bet in the midterm, so short short term five years, midterm ten to fifteen years, standalone non cloud based technologies will rise back up as major weather events cause problems for centralized servers and cause problems for centralized network access. So always on servers are always dependent on there being reliable internet. And if we see a period of floods and fires and challenges to always on access to the network, decentralization, whether it be decentralized batteries and then decentralized servers will be a redundancy system that will be valued enough to be paid for and installed. Of course, it wouldn't be uh, one of our slide decks without having an XKCD in here. I do like the, uh, the translation of research into what it means. I just said 10 years and said so we haven't finished inventing it yet, but when we do, it'll be awesome. Yes, that is accurate. Uh, 25 years is definitely the not impossible. All right, I want to talk about a couple of unresolved issues that I think are, these are trends that emerged and when I was looking in 2020 about future directions, I saw things here in these four points and they haven't been addressed, they haven't gone away. So the optimization of the black box. This is something where the ethics of business, there will be a point where to be registered as an ethical business or to be accredited through certain standards and practices or accountants will go and say, if we cannot go and audit the algorithm that makes decisions in your firm, we will not sign off on your firm's records. So I think this will, 
Governments like black box algorithms because things like robo-debt where, oh, it was the software, means that nobody ever has responsibility for anything. And you can be as cruel as you like to people who don't have the lawyers to punch back harder than you've punched them. But the black box optimization and the algorithm and the versus accountability, I think accountants, I think uh, the CPA is going to be the organization that says, no, we want to know how these decisions were made because there's financial vulnerabilities which we're not going to sign off and say your accounts are true and accurate records for tax purposes. We're not going to sign off on your accounts if we can't see how some of these decisions were made. The other element in here that I want to mention is this um, pervasive surveillance and this came up when we talked about the damage and the destruction of Audacity because putting trackers and putting tracking metrics in, there are, there's a business to government market for being able to track and control individuals. It's an established market. It's been around for decades. The thing is, there's a bigger market for freedom. There's a bigger market for not being tracked. And the government might be able to give you nice shiny pennies, but the public's going to give you bigger, bigger returns. Because at the end of the day, governments fall. Governments change. Policies come in to favour, policies go out of favour. The public doesn't like creepy bastards, and they've not liked creepy bastards for a very long time. And as soon as you are the creepy bastard of software, he can expect to be not liked, and that hurts your ability to get government contracts. The last uh, thing, this uh, goes to searchable past. Now, this is something that uh, emerged in 2020. Someone was using an automated attack pattern to go through old tweets. And we're talking, Twitter was established in 2006, so we're talking someone went back into archival posts 2007 to 2010 to find content that was within the terms of service at the time it was posted, but no longer within the terms of service as at the point of running this automated archive search. The presence of this data, the constant buildup of background noise of data and our digital footprints are opening us up to basically history attacks. Ghosts of searchable past is the ability to go and use an automated system through machine learning or algorithms or whatever you're using to attack an opponent by going through the sheer volume of material that they've created by being present on the internet and then finding how things that were 15, 20, and remember I've been on the internet for nearly 30 years, things that were acceptable common practice nearly 30 years ago you watch TV from the 1990s. You watch early 1990s movies. Compare those to 2020s movies. Society and standards have changed. So this is a, an API attack uh, using protocols to, and using automated systems to go digging through people's archives to find things that they did 20 years ago that are violations of terms of service today. Uh, so the algorithmic shell game, the worst part is Robocop, both Robocop movies, the original and the 2014 refit, both of them flagged this and made fun of it, and then some engineer watching the movie went, that is so cool, I can build that. This is why one of my sayings is, any sufficiently advanced dystopia is someone else's utopia. If you grew up reading The Hunger Games, and you looked at The Hunger Games and thought, Jeez, I'd like to be in the capital. I'd love to be one of the people who sends kids out to die. Congratulations, you're a TV network executive and you probably commissioned the movie. You probably emphasised the love triangle in the movie over the people's rising up against an oppressive state. But the, the algorithmic shell game, the idea of moving the pieces around but ultimately taking, finding a way to take out personal responsibility and attribute blame to a software package. 
we haven't hit the court case yet that goes and puts the ownership of the outcome onto the creator of the code. But we will, and it's coming. And governments may try and legislate to block it, but eventually somebody somewhere is the person who gave the go signal, and they are the person who then has the responsibility for the stop signal. Uh, so I mentioned AI and pass thing as that AI doesn't exist. We have machine machine learning, which is I have had cats that are smarter than machine learning systems and pick up much quicker on the uptake than machine learning is. Functionally, at the moment, any machine learning or artificial intelligence system is a very fast spreadsheet and it's a spreadsheet filled with human bias and whatever data you put into the system bakes the bias of that data into the system's behavior. AI is not a neutral concept. AI is not a neutral object. It is based on learnt. It learns from data sets. And if your data set is corrupted by human bias, the AI picks up the human bias. For example, when the police insert their neutral data that's been the result of intentional and deliberate racist profiling of minority groups in, to drive them out of key suburbs so that majority group developers can redevelop the properties for profit, stunningly, the white collar crime doesn't get flagged as the big thing despite it being more prevalent, more likely, and way easier to detect because the code was written from a database that was corrupt. So if your database successfully identifies every turtle it ever sees as a cat, congratulations, your AI is going to be functionally stupid. Also, there's a really good AI attack that you can use AI prioritizes written or typed labels over object recognition. If it can read the text, it will assume the object label is correct. So yeah, machine learning, look, there will be eventually useful applications of it. At present, one of the biggest problems is that the machine learning is both primitive, but also back from when I first encountered machine learning in the mid 90s. So it's not a new thing either. One of my colleagues had an impressive array of computers in his office and he was engaged in fuzzy logic machine learning research. And it turned out that what he would do is he would tell the machine what the right answer was and then it would learn the pathway to the right answer and then he'd give it new data and it would find the correct answer. Or in other words, it basically successfully skipped point A and went straight to point B and gave him the result he was looking for. So much like a cat or somebody studying for an exam, it was less interested in learning and more interested in what gets me the best grade. So don't worry, mates, you're not going to get taken out by machine learning because machine learning couldn't do a multiple choice quiz to save itself. That's why the Capatches work. All right, let's close up with uh, near to the end, theory of the week. Predicting the future with social media. Speaking of, all right. As I said, I'm a professional fortune teller, uh, also known as a marketing strategist. And one of the things that my job has been to do over years is second guess the movements of competitors. I use this inside the development of the marketing subject as well. I do a range of fortune telling type activities. I do a range of market segmentation to behavioral prediction, behavioral intention activity to try and work out what my course needs to have in terms of support features and functions. When I design it in June, knowing that the first time I'm going to meet my audience for it will be late July. 
So I do a lot of this. I do a lot of pragmatic future uh, future focused work. This particular paper is quite interesting in the idea that it opens up the concept of digital phrenology. Now, phrenology is one of those things where people decided that they would try and be able to predict a person's future by the lumps on their skull. Science has produced some really dumb ideas over time. And don't try and get out of it, medical science. This is all on you. You were the idiots who came up with phrenology. It wasn't a marketer who came up with that load of nonsense. But anyway, digital phrenology. This is the idea that if you can predict where the lumps are and you hit it lightly with a hammer, you can make the lumps appear and the person can have the future they want. This is my concern with the Twitter effect is that by going and saying, oh, if movie X has high volume positive within the first window of n number of days, somebody's going to write code to just flood the network with bots so that they think that if Twitter is outputting positive reviews of my movie, my movie will be successful, rather than actually going back and looking at it and saying, real humans expressing a judgment of, I like this, other people might like it too, means that the movie's quite good and quite uh, got quite broad appeal. So be careful about this. The other thing to note about this uh, is, welcome to the tragedy of my professional career. Look at the date of the movies that are being analysed. Look at the data, the age of the data involved here, and the fact that this paper came out in 2021. There is occasionally hellacious lag time between our ability to predict the future, write up about the future, and get it published some point in the near distant future after we've written it. So, in conclusion, and wrapping it up, 2020, eh? How's that going to go for us? So, post your predictions, post your in the forum. What do you reckon next year's radar looks like? What's what's on the horizon? What do you think we've got to watch for? What do you think is the big opportunity? What's the big risk? Uh, what's the SWOT analysis of the future look like? And with that, closing it out with an XKCD double header. It is one of my things in life is that I hope to never create a time machine because all I've ever wanted to do with a time machine is use it for services marketing to go back and get seats on flights that I knew were underbooked. So I've got nothing other in mind than to go and use excess hotel capacity because our historical records will show us where the rooms were spare and cheap. If you need me, there's the points of call, there's the points of contact. As always, you can, and once we clear through the end of semester and things over, if you do want to keep in touch post-semester, I've got the email, I've got the social connections. Feel free to connect, have a chat, and any point in the future, if you work on a project, you work on a campaign, and you just want to bounce an idea past an e-marketer, give us a shout. And if you find yourself in the future, work in a campaign and think, you know, this is the sort of thing that would go nice in an e-marketing subject, give us a shout and I'll see if I can get my students of that time involved in your project. Because it would be nice to keep the family connection going. Now with that, this is the end. It's interesting recording this in advance because it will have been an honour and it will have been a journey and thanks for coming along the ride. I ask a lot of my students and I expect a lot of people, I push, I support, I do what I can. But at the end of the day, you lift each other up. The rising tide supports all boats. You backed each other, you supported each other. And I am grateful to have been part of this experience. And I say this as the fortune teller and the future seer. It's been an honour. Cheers, mates. For the last time, signing off.